This is a situation where what is referred to as geometric bet sizing is often employed, where you want to make a similar bet size on the turn and the river. And in this scenario, if Negranu bets something like 70% pot on the turn, he can then jam something like 70% pot on the river. Hello everyone, I am Jonathan Little for PokerCoaching.com, back with another hand from High Stakes Feud, where Doug Polk and Daniel Negranu are battling it out, playing 200-400. No limit Texas Hold'em. Let's take a look at this hand where Daniel Negreanu raises it up with Queen Nine of Hearts. And Doug Polk gets the pocket aces. That's always nice when you're playing heads up. He's going to put in the three bet. And when you three bet the aces, you're saying, please, 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 please have a hand. However, you're going to find that you should actually defend against three bets. Heads up, in position, pretty wide. If you have not thoroughly checked out the free preflop charts I have available for you, check those out at pokercoaching.com slash H-U-N-L. This is a spot where Doug Polk should three bet aces basically every time. DeGranu should call with Queen Nine of Hearts very frequently if he doesn't decide to put in a little four bet every once in a while. And we are going to go to the flop. Flop comes ace, three, three. This is a spot where Doug Polk should bet very frequently. And if you look at this bet size, this is actually about 38-ish uh, percent pot. And if you recall, what most players do in this scenario when they three bet before the flop and then they continuation bet the flop is they bet about 25% pot. However, I'm sure Doug Polk has studied this spot extensively. I'm sure he's gone through all of these common scenarios. And if you take a look at this, the GTO strategy is actually to bet 38% pot a lot of the time. And it actually generates more EV than using only a small 25-ish percent pot bet, which it seems like Negreanu is doing a lot of the time in three bet pots. And to be fair, Doug Polk is a lot of the time too, and you're gonna find that bet size is very often preferred, but not in this spot. Turns out in this spot on this Jack 3-3 three, three board, the pocket aces just wants to bet bigger because he get more money in the pot. So a very, very cool spot to show that Doug Polk very clearly knows what to do in these scenarios. All right. Queen nine of hearts, pretty easy call for Negranu. You may say, why call with queen high? Well, anytime you have backdoor straight draws, backdoor flush draws, you're in position, you're closing the action, as you will be in heads up, um, and you're getting very good pot odds, you really just can't fold any hand that is anywhere near reasonable. And as we see here, queen nine of hearts, all queen nines actually, stick around the vast majority of the time. Even queen eight, queen seven, queen six, queen five, stick around as long as they have a backdoor flush draw, which, you know, may seem a little bit wide, but it turns out you just have to call a lot of heads up. Otherwise, you're going to get pushed around a ton. Turn comes the queen of spades, and this is where it gets interesting. So this is a spot where I think for Doug Polk, it may make logical sense to do a whole lot of checking with your pocket aces to really, really, really strengthen your checking range. And that is actually what Doug Polk does. But if we go over here and look at the GTO strategy, it actually prefers to, check, uh, to bet the pocket aces the vast majority of the time using a 66% pot size bet. And it may make logical sense to a lot of people out there, yeah, bet your aces, duh. But you actually should be checking some decently strong hands in this scenario to essentially trap your opponent whenever they have a bluffy hand or some sort of junk hand here that you really want them to have the opportunity to bluff off with. I guess it makes sense to bet with the aces though, because if your opponent does have a queen, they're not going to fold. If they do have a jack, you're not, they're not going to fold and you beat all of that. But take a look at this, right? Like ace queen actually does check a lot of the time here, 32% of the time or so. Um, king queen checks a lot of the time, 35% of the time. Pocket queens checks very, very frequently. Pocket jacks checks very, very frequently. So this is a spot where you want to make sure you are protecting your checking range by checking with some premium hands. Notice other hands, Doug Polk would opt to check here all these ace highs that, you know, you'd have to check and then probably fold to a bet. And you don't really want to face a bet all that often, which is why you want to protect your checking range sometimes. Also notice even some of the weaker queens are checking a large chunk of the time. The jacks are checking a large chunk of the time. So there is a lot of checking going on here, 57% for Doug Polk. If we take a look at the hands that are betting, it's just a lot of very strong hands. Um, then some bluffs, like ace-10 and king-10. Actually, notice a lot of king highs are opting to bluff, which is pretty neat to see. Even hands like, you know, king-5 are betting this turn. Because they have an overcard, right? Makes some sense. Whenever you lack showdown value, but you have a little bit of equity, you want to keep betting. All of these straight draws are opting to bet. 
Seven three six three five three four three and three two are all betting. These are all trips. Whenever you have trips, you do want to just put money in the pot. So interesting spot where uh, Doug Polk does decide to check, which looks like a bit of a mistake compared to the solver. But if you look at the EV between betting and checking, it's not all that big of a deal. So this is a fine play for Doug Polk. Around to Negranu with the Queen Nine of Hearts. I want you to take a second and think about what you would do with queen nine of hearts here. Let's say we're in this three bet pot, we floated the flop, and we your opponent checks a turn when you get the queen. Should you check, bet small, bet two-thirds pot, or bet large, like an overbet? So should we check, bet a third pot, bet two-thirds pot, or overbet? What I want you to do is I want you to pause this video and write below what you would do in the comment section. That's going to go a long way to helping you make good use of this study opportunity and learn Hold'em better. So go ahead, pause, pause the video and do it. I'll wait. Okay, did you do it? This is an interesting scenario because when Negranu turns the queen and Doug Polk checks, the queen is almost always the best hand, especially if we know Doug Polk is mostly betting when he has pocket aces on the turn, which, you know, he doesn't, so we're off the solver at this point. But Negranu does go for a small-ish bet, about a third pot. Let's take a look at what the solver recommends, though. It turns out the solver actually recommends a bigger bet size, about 70% pot, eh, call it two-thirds pot, in this scenario. And you're going to see that the small bet is actually not used much at all. This is a situation where what's referred to as geometric bet sizing is often employed, where you want to make a similar bet size on the turn and the river. And in this scenario, if Negranu bets something like 70% pot on the turn, he can then jam something like 70% pot on the river. And that's going to allow him to use 70% pot, 70% pot on the turn and the river. And you're going to find that is often the strategy that is used when you are generally betting a somewhat polarized range. And just to show Negranu is betting somewhat polarized here, he's betting a lot of queens, which are probably good, and then a lot of king highs, which are definitely not good, right? So he's betting a lot of queens that are effective nut hands, especially given Polk's turn checking range, and he's betting a lot of king highs, junky draws, and of course the threes. So um, this is probably a bit of an error for Negranu, where he's leaving a little bit of value on the table by not betting bigger in general. Um, Polk does call. Interesting to note that at this point, we're far off the solver for Doug Polk because he, you know, would have normally bet the aces on the turn. If he did have aces, though, on the turn, this is actually a hand that opts to check raise. I, I Notice the cell is empty here, so you can't really go off this too much. But take a look. You see that the pocket aces, if you do have them, whatever tiny sliver it is, opts to raise 99% of the time to a small raise, which is kind of neat to see. Notice if Polk did check a hand like ace-queen, though. Remember I mentioned he should do that? He should be check raising small with the ace-queen a large chunk of the time. Other sporadic check raises includes ace-10, right, for a gut shot, kind of neat. Ace-king every once in a while for a gut shot. Pocket twos. This is where, like, solver is really hard to play, <laughs> like, because I, I don't think in any world I would consider check raising the pocket twos, but hey, that's what the solver does. Whenever I look at a solver image like this where you're supposed to check raise a relatively small amount of the time, I'm not going to say you should just check raise never, but it's like not the worst thing in the world just to not have much of a check raising range here, especially when it is a very, very small sliver of your range and you're just doing a ton of calling and folding. Because in the scenario, if Negranu actually is polarized, then you don't really want to be raising all that often. You don't really want to raise against a polarized range because against the premium hands, you're in bad shape. Against the um, draws, well, the good draws are not going to fold and the junky draws are drawing thin anyway and you want to keep those in and let them bluff. Um, that said, notice this ace, queen, and king, queen that are opting to raise. They actually beat a lot of Negranu's range here because most of Negranu's range is a lot of these queens. So whenever your nut hands or your premium hands beat Negranu's strong value range, it certainly does make sense to put in the raise with hands like that. So cool scenario. Anyway, Polk does elect to call. Rivers of War, Polk checks. And now this is a situation where, given the way the hand is played out, Negranu has to presume he has the best hand a lot of the time. But notice here, he has like, what, 1.2x pot on the river? Remember, if he bet just an extra few thousand on the turn, the pot would instead be something like 31,000, and he'd have something like 25,000 behind, allowing him to make that 70% pot bet. Remember, geometric bet sizing would be 70% pot, 70% turn, 
And um, usually you're gonna find that is what the GTO solver recommends. Once Polk checks though, I, I, I certainly don't fault Negranu for going for the bet, but as you're betting more and more, as you're overbetting the pot, you're gonna find that your opponent should actually fold out a lot of hands you're trying to get value from. So let's take a look at Negranu's river strategy here. Um, I, wa I wanna note that we are presuming Negranu made the bigger, uh, the smaller bet size here, right? Which kind of throws off the solver again. But if he does happen to have a queen nine at this point, you see that he's going all in with it every time. All the queens are likely to go all in. Lots of king highs are going all in. Um, kind of interesting to see that a hand like king 10 does not bluff because it's kind of blocking some of Polk's automatic folds. So um, it turns out that the lower king X are the hands that would prefer fold because they don't block hands like ace 10 that um, Polk could still have, right? You don't really want to have king 10 because it blocks Polk's ace 10 that will fold to a river bet. You'd rather have ace 7 because it makes it more likely that Doug Polk does have that random ace high that will fold to a river shove. Um, so anyway, this is a spot where Negranu does opt to shove, and I think that's perfectly fine and viable. Turns out top pair, even in a three-bet pot, is pretty great heads up. And obviously Polk has an easy call. Let's take a look at what Polk sh quote unquote should call with here. It's pretty pretty easy strategy, mainly just calling Jackson better, like decent Jackson better. Um, everything else folds, pretty logical, right? Pocket fours ran, okay, pocket fours made the nuts. Okay, I was gonna say pocket fours randomly calls, that's weird. <laughs> oh yeah, pocket fours calls. Um, not much to see here. You may be surprised to see that some jacks should call off in this scenario, but you know, like I said, top pair is pretty strong heads up in a three bet pot, so is middle pair. So interesting scenario where Polk kind of went off the solver on the turn and that um, resulted in him stacking Negranu. That said, I, I definitely think Negranu played this hand fine besides his turn bet sizing. So interesting spot where both players were a little bit off the solver and that's neat to see. Heads up, no limit hold'em is a difficult game to learn and master. It's hard to play like the solver even if you're trying your best to play like the solver. And these players are gonna continue battling it out. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, click the like and subscribe buttons below. If you enjoyed the interactive learning experience here, also check out my training site, pokercoaching.com. You can get a free trial membership at pokercoaching.com slash free. We have over a thousand interactive quizzes like this. So if you want to continue studying and improving your poker skills so that you can win more money, crush your opponents and better your life, check that out. Have a great day, enjoy your week, and I will talk to you next time. Thanks for watching. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want more strategy lessons, preflop charts, and interactive quizzes, make sure you get your free membership to pokercoaching.com right now at pokercoaching.com slash free. I'll talk to you next time.